Amen. Good. Hey, that's the end result right there. We're all going to be in heaven someday, and we'll look each other up around the throne. Thank you for that good song. I like that. Take your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And while you're turning there, um, I, we're in a series on Sunday night on the apocalypse, the book of Revelation. Don't want to miss tonight. Tonight, we're going to talk about the 144,000. And no, they're not the Jehovah Witnesses or the seven-day Adventists. And so forth. Very clearly, they're Jewish. And we'll have a lot to say about that tonight. We'll have something to say about those saved during the tribulation period. You say, preacher, will there be people saved in the tribulation period? Yes. And we'll tell you who they'll be. And uh, that's tonight. Don't want to miss that. I'm excited about it. I hope you are. And uh, let's stand together, please. Read them God's Word. First Timothy chapter number 6. We'll begin reading in verse number 3. First Timothy chapter 6. Thank you for your faithfulness. It's beautiful out there. In Tennessee, they say the uh, leaves are not quite as peak and pretty as they have been in the past for some reason. I think it has to do with the, the, the drought and all that. But we're hoping we see some good leaves uh, next week maybe up in Pigeon Forge. But this is a beautiful time of the year. I love this. The skies seem bluer. Right now the grass seems greener. And everything's just lovely out there. And uh, let's remember to stop and thank God for the beauty of creation. He paints a picture for us every day. And let's be, reminds us that there is a God in heaven. And we should live for him. And uh, thank him and worship him. And then someday we'll live with him uh, there around the throne. First Timothy chapter 6. Begin reading verse number 3. In this section, Paul is instructing a young pastor named Timothy that's going to take things and run with it. And uh, he tells him... This in verse number 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions of strifes, of words, wherefore cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. And that's pretty much talking about uh, people just get off track, what the purpose of the church is and the purpose of Christianity is. They start to, uh, just all kind of a gossip and so forth. Verse 5, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, it is, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. In having food, food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, while, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. And pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Now, I'm not preaching on this at all, but verse 10, notice the phrase says, The love of money is the root of all evil, not money. I think people can have money and have it in the right way, but when we cover after it, when we have a love for it, when money becomes our God and our drive, we've blown it and we've erred from the faith. There's going to be a lot of sorrow that follows born again people that get their priorities misaligned. Verse number 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Verse 12, Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. That's my text verse. I'd like you to read verse 12 with me together in unison. Let's read that together. Ready? Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I want to speak on this subject for just a while this morning. Let's start a fight. <laughs> now, I'm a lover, not a fighter, but I want to start a fight today. I want to start a fight down in your soul. I want to fight, start a fight down deep inside of you that you used to fight years ago, but for some reason you've given up. Some, something has cooled you in this fight. And I want to talk about that for just a while. America needs to fight. The church needs to fight again. Amen. And your home and your family and your marriage needs to have a fight down inside of you that could cost you everything if you don't start fighting. I want to talk about that for just a while this morning. Let's start a fight. Father, you know my heart. You know where I'm heading. 
And you know, Lord, today that I'm relying on you. And I ask you, Lord, please to fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. Teach us, Lord, not just, not just doctrine and principle, but teach us how to fight again spiritually. And Lord, I pray you'll convict us if we're not fighting today. The good fight. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. Earlier this week, I had some idea about what I'd like to preach this morning, and God just kind of changed that. On Friday, I was driving uh, into the office, and there was a car that got in front of me, and a lot of folks put on the back window something uh, of their uh, back window of their vehicle, something that uh, they, they enjoy. Sometimes it's a football team. Sometimes it's maybe some particular uh, sport or hobby or whatever. Uh, sometimes it's just, I love my truck, you know, and thank God for that. But uh, anyhow, this one caught my eye, and I have seen these signs on the back of vehicles that, that uh, remind us of a loved one in memory of, and they'll put the name of the person and the date of their birth and date of their death. And, and I see those things, and I, 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 it just touches my heart sometimes because here's somebody that was not ready for this person to die in their life, and they, they're carrying that. They're carrying a heavy load. And so when I see those in the back of the window of a vehicle, I, I'm thinking about that. And then uh, this, particular, this particular sign in the back of this window caught my attention for some reason. Because it, it was where I was thinking. It was where I was living. Sometimes when I drive, I pray. By the way, I pray with my eyes open, not my eyes closed. But I, I pray often. I, I think about things. I was coming in the office, and I was asking God just to lead me, you know, in my day and and I saw this in the back of the window. It said this. It said, Kelly's fight. I don't know who the person was, but it said, Kelly's fight. And then it had the ribbon there and the, and the pink ribbon, which was a sign of cancer and so forth. And I saw that, and immediately I knew that that person was helping a person named Kelly in a fight with cancer. And I thought about that's obviously where they're living at. And, and I had a word of prayer for that family as I was driving. And I thought about how uh, uh, in Kelly's fight, no doubt the, her family gathered around her. And, and no doubt there were people kind of coaching her on and cheering her on. And by the way, that fight with cancer is a life or death fight. How many understand that? Now, how many understand when cancer invades your family, uh, the fight is on. You can just kind of give up if you want to. And uh, you can just let nature take its course and go ahead. But there are people that, that just fight. And when they fight and they get this chemo and radiation coming at you, and there's days you don't want to get up, you don't want to do anything, you want nobody to bother you, and sometimes you can completely close yourself off from everyone. It takes good people that love people that want to come in and say, come on now, you can do that. You, want, you, can, you can get out and, and let me help you get ready for your day and so forth. It takes folks to gather around you to Fight your way through that terrible disease called cancer. Between here and Nashville, there's a sign. I see it every time I drive into Nashville. I think it's on the right right there. And there's this lady. I think it's for uh, the hospital over here. But there's a lady that she's just going like this and she, in the picture. And she says, cancer, you lose. How many of y'all have seen that sign? Cancer, you lose. By the way, thank God for every time cancer loses. Amen. But I promise you there's a fight that is put up whenever affliction comes into your life. It doesn't matter if you've had open heart surgery. It doesn't matter if you had some other type of disease. There may be some of you right now, you're fighting some affliction right now. May I challenge you, don't ever give up the fight. The fight is worth it. And can I say today that there, there is another fight that we need to be fighting. I was reminded again, when I got to the office, I was reminded I'd been kind of isolated from some of the news early in the week because we were traveling some, and I was trying to get caught up on some of the news, and all of a sudden, boom, I saw where uh, just last week there was a, a group of about 30 of our Delta Force military, U.S. military, that joined the hands with the Kurdish forces. And earlier in the week, they invaded a... And an uh, uh, ISIL Islamic State compound that were holding about 70 some uh, hostages there. We found out later who these hostages really were. But when we invaded them, we thought they were innocent citizens there, 70 of them. And you wonder, well, what, what this just came out of nowhere. Were we that involved over there in the Middle East? And I, by the way, I was thankful. Anytime Delta Force shows up, I love it. I mean, Navy SEALs, I love it when our military goes in there and they come out victorious. Somebody say amen right there. 
I love it. I like the shock and awe of Desert Storm. You might and you say, you're warped. No, I like it when America wins. I like it when America is strong. That's what I like. I like a good fight when you go in and you think, oh, we're going to win this thing. We go in with everything and Delta Force went in with everything. And sadly, as I read the statistic, there was one casualty in that. 39-year-old Master Sergeant Joshua Wheeler of Roland, Oklahoma, was killed in small arms fight there. And, uh, and we, we grieve, of course, the loss of this fighting man uh, of our U.S. military. But the military successfully freed 70 hostages, killing 15 ISIL combatants and capturing many others. I like the, the way this story ends. After the prison compound was cleared of everybody, it only took about an hour and 45 minutes. But after the compound was cleared, they brought in F-15 fighter jets and they bombed that thing beyond recognition. Amen. Amen. I love it. I love it. You say, you're a warmonger. No, I'm up for a good fight. I want to fight evil. How many understand ISIL's evil? Amen. And we need to fight it. And I thought about the things we fight for. I think about things you probably fought for this past week. I'll tell you this. If somebody did something wrong to one of your kids, the fight is on. Now, my wife sitting over here is one of the sweetest people you'll ever want to be around. But whenever Joel was younger, I remember one particular incident we were still back in West Virginia that came up on some particular ball thing. I could see my wife's hair bristle up on the back of her head. You say, you're not like that, are you, preacher? Oh, no, I'm just like that. You know, we have, we have, there's something inside of us that calls us to fight for our kids. Is there anybody out there? And even our grandkids. Which, by the way, there's a good one right now over in that nursery right there. But uh, we know they all can do some wrong, but there are just some things worth fighting for. How many say there's things worth fighting for in life? And we could go on and on. I mean, some of y'all fight for your politics, and I'm going to tell you what, this year, 2016, the fight is on. Amen. I mean, you know, you, and by the way, there ought to be a fight on. Somebody ought to be fighting for the heart and soul of America. We fight for some strange things. We fight for our ball teams. They win some. They lose some. You get mad when they lose, and you love them when they win. But we, you know, we sit there, and we fight, and we cheer. We scream at the television, which does no good. We scream at the referees, which does no good. I don't know that I've ever seen a referee ever change a call. If they did, I, I, mean, I missed it. But there's another fight. This one scares me. I've been a pastor for many years now. Something has caught me completely off guard. I was not ready for this. I never thought that a true born-again Christian would ever lose their fight spiritually. You see, when I got saved as a little boy, I, I mean, I, I was all in. I remember when I got saved, by the way, you're looking at somebody that when I got saved as a little boy, I have never doubted my salvation. Now, that may sound strange to you. I know many do doubt their salvation, but I've never doubted my salvation. I thank God for a mom and dad that read the Bible in the home. They had family devotion in the home that my mom and dad were true blue. I never saw them drink a bottle of beer. I never saw them smoke a cigarette. They kept us in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. They were the real deal. When we came home, we read the Bible. We had family devotion. They were the real deal. It could be that some of your kids doubt their salvation because they've never seen moms and dads that are true blue. I don't know. I'm just saying you're looking at somebody that, that, that they, that I never saw my mom and dad argue. If they argue, they shut the door and bolted it and we never heard them. But when I got saved, I've been in all over. When God called me and my wife in the ministry, he called me and my wife just said, glory to God, I love you, I'm on too. But anyway, when God called me in the ministry, I want you to understand, I gave it all up, lock, stock, and barrel. I didn't get into this thing to have an easy ride. I got in this thing because I thought there was a fight on. I sat back there I listen to my preacher preach, and, and uh, I'd get all excited about, you know, what we need to do. And, man, I'd be out there for a soul and a visitation on Thursday, and sometimes it's just me and the preacher. That was it. I thought, I look around and say, does anybody not know the fight's on? Is there nobody else out there? 
And I remember when I served even a, as a layman in the church as a as, as youth pastor and so forth, I wondered, was there anybody else that understood there was a fight on? In all these years, uh, God called me to preach after that. And I went to Bible college. I left my job. We sold our house. We went in this thing lock, stock, and barrel because I realized there was a fight on. I didn't get into it to write books. I didn't get into it to have a big church. I didn't get into it to have some big name somewhere. I didn't get into it for those reasons. I got into it because I realized there was a fight on. People were dying on their way to hell. There were families breaking up. There were kids going out into rebellion. I realized I was a real life walk on talking devil. I realized there was a fight on. And all these years, in all these years, I've done my best, as one person can do, to try to do my part in the area of the battle that I was fighting in. And I thought that the closer we would get to the Lord's return, I thought people would, the more, the more people would fight. I was not ready for this. I was not ready. I mean, how many believe that Jesus Christ is coming again? How many believe that it was Gog and Magog or at the door right now? How many believe that he could come any day right now? You see, I would think in Romans 10, or Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You see, I was thinking that the closer we got to the Lord's return, that old soldiers would come out fighting. That's what I thought. I thought that young Christians would be more faithful. I thought that we just had this man, I mean, as Jesus returned, uh, got closer, I just thought there would be this, this army of people that maybe had got away from the church, been unfaithful or whatever, this army of people come back. Maybe some folks inside the church that used to serve God and had laid down their sword, would pick their sword back up and go at it one more time. That's what I thought. And as I worked this thing around my mind, I thought, well, was I naive? Did I miss something here? And I came to find out that the only person I can keep right is Mike Norse. The only person I can put any fight in is Mike Norse. The only person I can judge their fire is me. And I want to ask you as we get into this thing this morning, I want you to judge the fight that's in you spiritually. If I could start a fight in you right now, I've accomplished what I've set out to do. I'm just going to tell you this, going into this, this, this next generation, whatever's ahead of us right now, and I've told you this, I've told you for three years now, you're not going to be able to have Christianity as usual. You're going to have to be strong in the faith. There are some things worth fighting for. I never dreamed God's people would give up so easy. The church of the living God has the answer to society's woes, and it seems like we're crawling back into our hole. While the sodomites are coming out of the closet, the church is going in the closet. While Islam is becoming a prevalent religion in America right now, the church is at an all-time low. And last time I checked, we had the word of God that's inspired, infallible, inerrant, it's preserved. It's laying in your hand. You have the very word of God. The Koran is not the word of God. Amen. Last time I checked, we had the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Somebody say amen. amen. The moment you get saved, the Holy Spirit of God comes inside of you. It's sealed. He seals you to the day of redemption. One reason you'll never burn in hell is because the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you. But he doesn't just want to indwell you. He wants to empower you. And it's time that you and I reach in and find the fight inside of us to get the fullness of the Spirit of God in us. Paul tells Timothy here, you can't afford not to fight. Everybody's looking at you. You're going to have to fight the good fight of faith. And I want you to notice by way of introduction that it is, a, it is faith that we're fighting for, first of all. We're fighting for our faith. Fight the good fight of faith. We're to fight for our own faith in God. You're here today, and you're not sure that you're a born-again Christian. I want you to understand that the Holy Spirit of God, how He works is this. It's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual fight. And right now, and by the way, every time we walk inside these doors, you know that an invitation is about to be given. And every time you know that, you know there is a spiritual fight going on for the souls of men and women, boys and girls. And you as a born-again Christian, I'll be praying that the Holy Spirit of God always wins that fight. 
And the crowd this size, I know this, I know there are people who walked in here, you're not sure that you're saved. There's a fight on. I want to challenge you to fight the fight. Break through, grab hold of eternal life. And we're to fight for our faith after we're saved and we're born again. We continue the fight doesn't end. We're to fight for the faith of the gospel. You would think in an independent fundamental Baptist church we, we would not have to fight for the faith of the gospel, that the gospel should always be front and center. But can I say that as your pastor, I find myself constantly fighting, trying to get the gospel out to the community, constantly begging folks to go soul winning, trying to get folks on the bus route, trying to get folks to fill this choir up so you can sing the gospel of Jesus Christ, trying to get maybe the crowd down on the ball field and the crowd up in the church house. Amen, preacher. That's good preaching right there. I'm always trying to put the gospel out there and make it first place. Jesus Christ preeminent. It's a fight. We're to fight. He told Tim, he said, you fight for the faith. Fight for the faith of the gospel. We're to fight for uh, uh, the, the, our own faith and the faith that we're living in here as Christians. We're to take God's side here on planet earth. And as you leave the confines of this building today and you go out in the world, whether it's over the school or down the work or in the lunchroom, wherever it's at, you're all the time to be taking God's side on things. That's not happening like it should. You can sit there and blame the politicians for not taking God's side. Some of you say, well, why don't somebody tell the world what, what God says? And by the way, I'm waiting for that too. But I think what we ought to be doing is making sure that's what we're doing Amen. with our friends and with our neighbors. What's happened is we've lost our fight. We've gone quiet. We don't do it no more. Because you know the moment you step up and you say something about world religion or you say something about the gay marriage thing, or you say something about alcohol, or you say something, you know the fight's on. And can I get you to see that God is counting on Christians to be the salt and the light of this earth? Amen. We understand that the fight is all about our faith. Secondly, I have this written down, it is a good fight. It is the right thing to do. You understand that as our church fights the good fight of faith, we make a way for God to work. You understand as we fight the good fight that folks are saved, they're born again. Folks get baptized. Marriages are held together. As I fight for the home, as I stand here and tell you uh, some things that you should not be bringing in your home, as I try to pour my heart out and try to study and pray, I'm throwing things out there so you can keep your marriage together. As you keep your marriage together, you're able to be a witness and testimony in this pagan culture we're living in. And folks, uh, uh, you're able to have a testimony where folks can come to Christ. You understand that this is a good thing. It's a good thing when our kids get saved over here in children's church and in Sunday school. It's a good thing when we have things for our youth department. It's a good thing when our kids are able to go to youth camp. It's a good thing to bring kids in on the bus. It's a good thing. You say, what's it all about? It's about the faith of the gospel. This fight that we're in is a good fight. We could have an entertaining church if that's what you want. We could just all come in here and just have a big dance party if that's what you think church is all about. But understand, that is not the good fight. That's the devil's fight. And I don't want to be involved in that at all. Fight the good fight. The fight of faith. Here's my last point. This is all introduction. It is nevertheless a fight. And that's what I want to start today. I want to start something down inside of you. It will cause you one more time to fight spiritually. For yourself first. For your marriage. For your kids. For your church. For Christ. Look what he says here. He says, first of all, fight the good fight of faith. He says, lay hold on eternal life. What's he talking about? Would you write this down, please? First of all, we should fight for the assurance of our salvation. Let's start there. This is elementary. Fight for the assurance of your salvation. When he says, lay hold on eternal life, he's saying this. He said, Timothy, you better know for sure you're going to heaven. Anytime a young man comes to me and they say, Preacher, I feel like God's called me to preach. Do you have any advice? I always have the same three things. Number one, 
make sure you're born again. You say, why is that so important? Because if a man is going to be the preacher of the gospel, he's going to have to tell, uh, his main job is to tell other people how to be saved. He better know for sure he's saved. On two occasions, when young men have come to me and they've asked me that question, on two occasions, both of them got saved in my office because they did not know for sure. That's, that's out of the ordinary, but that's happened. Secondly, I tell them this. You better make sure that the Bible is the Word of God. It is the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God. It's preserved because there are going to be people that's going to shake you in the Word of God. You're going to have to be unshakable. There will be people in your own church who come to you and they'll say, do you think that Bible really says that? You better make sure that you believe and you're going to live and die for that Bible. And the third thing I say is this. You better make sure that you're called. Because I can't tell you whether you're called or not. You better make sure that you're called. Because... I'm going to tell you, you're just asking for trouble. Any person that goes in the ministry has got this huge target on their back by Satan, and he'll do anything he can to drag you down. He'll make you sick. He'll bust your family up. He'll do all kinds of things. He, and and if that's, not, that's not even church trouble. Paul said this. He said, besides this, the care of all the churches. And can I tell you, there's not a day that goes by in our home that we don't feel that pressure from Satan. You better make sure that you're called. That has nothing to do with you unless you're called to preach. I'm just saying that what Paul was telling Timothy is this. He said, you need to have the assurance of your salvation. Timothy, you lay hold on eternal life. If you and I are going to fight the fight, the good fight of faith that's out there, that is the first thing you need to get nailed down. And today, you, I've been preaching to you for many years now, and I want you to understand that I've never tried to preach doubt in you. We have had from time to time preachers will come through and they'll stand behind this pulpit and they'll preach doubt, maybe for the purpose of getting a notch in their belt. But I've never done that to you. But I want you to know that you can know for sure you're going to heaven. And I want you to have that pinned down if you're going to fight the good fight. I want you to write this second one down. He says... In uh, verse number 12, fight the good fight, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called. I had this written down. Uh, we understand here, he says, he was called to this. This is your job. Not just as a pastor, Timothy, but as a Christian. I have this down. Fight against apathy in the ministry. Fight against assurance. Fight for the assurance of your salvation. Fight against apathy in the ministry. Now here's what I want to say. Okay, you don't have to raise your hand and say amen or whatever, but either you're a saved and you're a born-again Christian or you're not. So if you're in this thing, get in it all over. Get off the fence. He said, Timothy, he said, you fight the good fight of faith. He said, you're called this. That means that you're in you're in lock, stock, and barrel, and your only defense is to go at it just as hard as you can go at it. And you, you and I understand the apathy that's in our churches today. The I don't care. My wife and I was in a restaurant, I think, yesterday, and we saw a man walking out. His hat said, I don't know. No, it said, don't know, don't care. And that's the average thought today. By the way, you may be out there in the workforce. That's how you feel. It may, it may be how you feel about world uh, economics and politics and all that. But a Christian cannot afford to say in their heart, I don't know what's going on in the church, and I don't care. And you just come in here and pop down and get up and move on. I'm going to tell you what, you're not going to survive like that. Neither is this church. And fight the good fight in this matter of apathy. Today, and I'll get this in just a moment, but if something down inside of you is just cold and you know you're stale and you, you, you sit there and you know, and it's been going on for weeks, maybe months, maybe years in your life, and you know that something has died inside of you spiritually, I'm challenging you right now. I'm challenging you. Start a fight. Get some fight back in you. What I'm talking about right now is an epidemic in good churches and that's why all across this land I talk to preachers. Regular. 
what I'm talking to you right now is everywhere. It's an epidemic. And I can't change it. But you can change it. And our society is counting on us to change it. It's a fight nonetheless. Fight for the assurance of salvation. Fight this matter of apathy. And look, look what he says. He makes a very dynamic statement. Paul tells young Timothy, he says, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called. You're committed, he says. And has professed a good profession before many witnesses. Why did he say that? Why did he look at Timothy and he says, look, Timothy, he said, you've already told everybody that you're a Christian. You've walked away from family and friends. You have publicly made this profession in front of everybody. He's saying this. Now, for the sake of the cause of Christ, you take your stand. Don't backslide. Don't fall away. Write this third thing down, and that is this. We need to fight against apostasy in this age. Now, understand that, that theologically, an apostate person has, has, is not born again. They've either been deceived or they are intentionally deceiving. They're actually people inside of churches that they know they're not saved, and they intentionally slip into churches to cause problems. Paul talked about that. There are other folks that have never been born again that they're deceived and they need help with that. But nevertheless, this makes up what is called the apostate church. And, and maybe I'll preach on that later on sometime. But for the sake of right now, one of the leading things that's going on in our society right now is this raising of the head of apostasy. It is full-blown and you've heard me talk about it and preach on it recently. I want to show you something right here in Timothy's writings. This scares me. Uh, turn back just one chapter, chapter 4. Look what he tells him in verses 1 and 2. Verses 1 and 2. First in the chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. This would be the falling away in the times leading up to the rapture of the church. And it scares me how good people can become so calloused and so seared. You see, I, I can't, as a Christian, let alone as a pastor, I can't judge anybody in here. Again, I already told you, I can only judge myself. I can't judge anybody in here uh, about where you're at with God. Are you saved, lost? Only th the Bible says, by their fruits shall know them. And I'm assuming that whenever folks raise their hand, they say they're saved. I'm assuming all of you are saved. That's between you and God. And I'm always thankful that a lot of folks profess to be saved. That's not the issue. The issue we have before us right now are those that are not saved. And those that are saved is being led astray by this apostate crowd. Those are weak Christians. Those are Christians that, that they, they do not have the foundation they need to get them through all the doctrinal mess that, that's out there right now. All the philosophy that's out there right now. And by the way, we lose folks like this. Every ch church loses folks by those who want some maybe easier method uh, of, of religion or their faith or whatever. Uh, they downplay the doctrine of the Bible. They tolerate wicked sins such as sodomy and adultery, fornication, abortion, and drunkenness. And I, I just tell you, the, the statistics are telling a story on the church in America. Because there was a day that, that not, not that long ago that no church would ever uphold drinking of alcohol. And now the age in this age of apostasy, there are a lot of churches that say you can do that. And there are preachers that do it as well. Now we're beginning, this, now that sodomy is the law of the land, uh, 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 gay marriage, now uh, people are, churches are getting on board with that left and right. And here's what gets me. As your pastor, it is my job to fight the good fight of faith. And what I need is folks not waffling in these seats right here. I need you taking your stand too. I didn't get enough amens right there. I need you taking your stand too. This ain't no game. 
We treat it like that. Folks are backing down. Abortion on demand now is just, it's just like, well, you know, I'll vote for that person. It's just because they believe abortion's okay. What is wrong with you? And we wonder why we can't defund Planned Parenthood. By the way, I like what's going on right now. We'll see where it goes. But I'm just saying, we're living in a nation right now that's, that we can, we can blame what goes on in Washington or we can come back to the church house and say, what in the world is wrong with us? Why don't we take our stand for God? We've lost our fight. Need to get our fight back. Bring it down to the church house. Where does it all start? Divisiveness, gossiping, backbiting, pettiness. We get our minds completely off what this church was founded for. This church is here exclusively for reaching the lost. And I know there's different ways you can do that. And by the way, I signed off on a lot of what goes on around here. But never in a million years did I ever think that God's people would allow it to flip-flop on us. Folks now in, in this age are unfaithful to church. Many struggle with knowing what the Bible says. Unfazed by even the presence of Satan's attacks. Well, a preacher says Satan's attacking us. I don't know where he gets that. Unfazed. There are times that I can almost smell the sulfur. And we just don't get it. Here's what I'm saying. There was a time when you would have agreed with everything I just said. And you need to fight your way back to that time again. Some fail to fight. Demas, the Bible says, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, he said, Paul said about Demas, he said, He's left me, having loved this present world. So we know that even good men like Demas, they just couldn't take it. They walk away. Paul talked about John Mark, who uh, turned back, some say, because of his fear of the ministry. The Bible teaches us here in these first few verses of chapter 6 how some uh, will err from the faith because of materialism and their love of money. So some fail in the fight. Then some fight the wrong battle. Back in uh, chapter 1, verse 20, he talks about uh, Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom he says, I have delivered unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. And so there are actually those that are enemies of the faith inside the church. And he said, uh, he said here, he said, I've turned them over to Satan. He said, I'll teach them that they don't blaspheme God and the things of God. And I'm just saying that there are some that will get completely off track with what the ministry is all about, what the Christian life is all about. I want you to never get caught up in that. Because the fight is a good fight. The fight is all about faith. And there's no place to stop. Now get your fight back. I'm calling you to reach down inside of you if you're saved today. And get your fight back. If you're here and you're not sure you're saved, talk to somebody who can help you. Get it pinned down today. John 5, 1 John 5, 13 says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and understand that you can know for sure you're going to heaven. Don't dilly-dally around with that. Get that pinned down. We want to get some fight in you. We want you on our side. If you find yourself in a state of coldness spiritually, fight your way out. Make yourself read the Bible. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because I know how this is. We're all human beings. But if you'd be honest today, you'll say, Preacher, you just don't know how hard it is.
for me just to find some time to read my Bible. But we have time to check social network, watch television, read the paper, do our garden work, whatever. You don't understand the devil's role in all that? Someone comes to me and says, Preacher, I, don't, I just I can't, I don't ever pray. I mean, I just can't seem to find time to pray. And when I pray, it just seems like, you say, what are you? I'm just saying, you fight your way through that. Before you go to bed tonight, say, I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to fight. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to find time. I'm going to shut the television off. I'm going to put my cell phone down. I'm going to find time to read. I'm going to fight my way through that. Get up the next day and decide, I'm going to fight my way through that. I mean, when it comes to prayer, fight your way in that prayer closet. Find yourself a time that you get on your knees for God and pour your heart out to God. Fight for it. The devil will work against you day and night. He'll say other things are more important. Why waste your time praying? Nobody else is there. He never hears your words. I'm just saying you fight. We have not because we ask not. That same section, it says that we bicker and fight among us. Yet we have not because we ask not. I want you to understand that the way back out of this, the way out of spiritual apathy, the way to have the assurance of your salvation, the way that we're able to stay out of the mode of apostasy that's, that's crippling the church today is you fight your way out of that. Make up your mind you're going to separate from the world. Make up your mind. Fight your way out of that addiction. Fight your way out of that whatever that amusement is that's taking all your time. It's keeping you out of church. Just say, by the grace of God, I'm not going to let that keep me out of the house of God. I'm going to fight my way. How hard is it to get ready for church on Sunday morning? I learned as a child in our home that you get ready for church on Saturday night because my mama says the devil always fights on Sunday morning. My wife is sitting there right there right now and she'll tell you that we do all of our preparation as much as possible on Saturday night because the devil always fights on Sunday morning. Why do we keep our head in the sand and act like these things never happen? And you need to get some raw bone zeal and tenacity and reach down inside yourself and say, with the help of God, I'm not going to let myself end up in a backslidden heap of life. I'm going to get my fight back. We've been praying for revival right here. I want to challenge some of y'all. Let's fight for revival. With our prayers. And with our pure life. You think there's not a fight? Next time you're going through that checkout line and the Holy Spirit says to you, you give that person a gospel track. You tell me there's not a fight? You don't have one. You left them in the car. You, you think you know the people behind you. You don't want them to think you're weird. There's always a fight. Fight to come to church. Fight to read the Bible. Fight to pray. Fight to witness. Fight to give the tithe. Fight just to, just, wait, just name it. And the devil is winning the battle. And we like revival in our churches, this church included, because we are not willing to fight. But we'll fight about everything else. We'll fight about politics. I just get sick. See how hard you fight. I've had rheumatoid arthritis since when? 1990. I have tried everything in the book. I've drank stuff that probably was poison. I've carried acorns in my pocket. I've wore things around my wrist. I've sprayed my ankles with WD-40. I've taken everything Duke University and everybody else has ever had to take. I've never handled snakes, praise God. I'm not going to do that. I'll go crippled. If I <laughs> Found out here just the other day, cocaine works. Now, if I'd known that, I'd use it a long time ago. I'm just kidding you. You get sick, and you will grab hold of everything you can grab hold of to get better. You say, why? Because there's a fight in you physically. Get yourself some fight back spiritually. We'll let Satan take our kids from us. Take our country from us. 
All because we can't muster up any fight. May God help us. Why don't you start a fight today? Fight the good fight of faith. Father, today we love you and we thank you for fighting for our souls on Calvary. All through human history, Lord, you kept the blood there so that we could get to you. And your son fought his way to Calvary, set his face like a flint toward the rugged cross. He did not let Satan stop him. He didn't let man stop him. Lord, because the fight was on. Lord, how can we sit here when you've given us heaven so free and not put up a fight? Help us to fight for our families, for our marriages, for our church, for revival. There are some here today that need to fight for their very soul. Help them to win this day, please. In Jesus' name, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and no one's looking around. Here's the invitation. Some are already here at the altar. I wonder who'd say this, preacher. I'm saved. I know I'm saved. Would you pray for me? I need to get my fight back. Hold your hand up. Just be honest. I need to get my fight back. Why don't you all make your way on down here? Find yourself a place here. Let's pray today. You know what I'm saying is true. I'm talking about all of us, top to bottom. We need to get our fight back. We need to get our fight back. We're letting the devil win. You can't do it on your own. Some of you need to come and say, fight. I'm going to fight my way back to my personal devotional time. I'm going to fight my way back to my prayer time. I'm going to fight my way back. And uh, Preacher, I've got the place where I can come to church. I can take it or leave it. You need, to, you need to fight. You need to fight for that. Because that's the opposite of what God says. There's a fight on with the devil, and he's going to win if you don't put up a fight. Let's stand together, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. And folks are praying here. There's time for you. Just leave your seat and come on. Make it easy for some folks to get out. Let's come on down here. We lift our hands. We realize we need to get some fight back. I'm being honest. This is where it's at. The battle's on. Today, maybe you're here. You're not sure that heaven's your home. We'll have somebody on the end of each aisle with a Bible in their hand. They love to take that Bible and show you how you can be saved today. Why don't you come? Let's just settle it today. Settle it today. This morning, if you've been saved, not been baptized, there'll be a little battle right there going inside of you. Just come on. Let's go ahead. That's what the Lord wants you to do. Follow him in baptism. Church membership today. Maybe some sin has got a hold of you. You need to fight that stuff out of your life. You've let some things into your life, and you know it's there, and you're getting comfortable with it. Fight it off. Fight it off. Fight the good fight. Father, bless this invitation time. Please work in hearts, please. Save the lost. Draw us close. Maybe somebody is away from you. Bring them home today, please. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're singing right now. You come, would you?